So our next speaker is Dr. Stan Langhofo with the local and state real estate outlook. He's the founding director of the Center for Real Estate at Wichita State, Wichita state <laughs> University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Langhofo. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I always enjoy coming back to Hayes, and uh, this is a wonderful facility. We haven't been here before. I actually, last time I was in Hayes, my wife and I came to actually watch a high school musical, and we stayed overnight, and we raided a little restaurant. I think it's just across the railroad tracks here, a wonderful little breakfast brunch place uh, that we had in the morning. So we enjoy. I don't remember the name, but I remember we enjoyed it a great deal. And so, uh, in, like I said, I enjoy coming to Hayes. And it is my pleasure to be presenting this year's uh, Kansas Housing Markets Forecast. Um, you should have a copy of our Hayes Housing Outlook. It's the Ellis County is, is the data that we include in that. And that should be six, uh, at, your, at your tables. And then upstairs, you will find copies of the large forecast booklets that we do for all of the major markets, the metropolitan areas across the state which includes Kansas City, Lawrence, Manhattan, Topeka, and Wichita. And so please feel free to take those. Um, you know, we have generous sponsors throughout the, the region that help pay for these publications, and so we're very grateful for that. But I need to make a special note of thanks to the Kansas Association of Realtors and all of the realtor boards across the state, including the Hayes Board of Realtors, we have a contract with the Kansas Association of Realtors whereby we, we tabulate monthly MLS, multiple listing service statistics, for every MLS system across the state. And as a result, we are able to have access to those data, which allows us to do this annual forecast series. But it also means that local housing market statistics are available, and if you're interested in more details about the Hayes area and, and the housing statistics there, I'd encourage you to contact the Hayes Board of Realtors because they receive monthly reports that it's up to them to decide how they distribute them, but, but I think they make them generally available. And so, if you were with us last time, last year when we were here, this is a slide from my presentation. And I said at the current moment, um, housing market fundamentals, you know, I, I look at two fundamentals to project what will be happening in housing markets going forward. One of them is the labor market, and the other is the mortgage market. Do people have jobs, and can they get financing uh, to be able to purchase a house? And last year I said the fundamentals are really solid. Mortgage financing is widely available and cheap. I said it's historically low interest rates, could never get lower than they are right now. And I said labor markets are pretty healthy. But I, I, I ended my discussion of that with the statement that all of this could change fairly quickly. And there was a little bit of a concern that maybe, um, you know, wasn't quite sure what could happen, what might be, be waiting on the horizon, but somehow, yeah, it felt like you had to look over your shoulder because something bad would happen. Jeremy talked a little bit about how nobody predicted COVID. None of us could have guessed what it was, but I'll take at least a little bit of credit saying something could change quickly. Um, you know, we as economists are put on earth to make the weather forecaster look good. So when we have at least one thing that's marginally right, we have to take credit for it. Um, so Jeremy talked about the labor market and he talked about concerns that we have broadly about, about this. And, and the concern that I really want to point to is that so far, housing markets don't appear to have been affected at all by the job losses, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. But the job losses that we've seen so far and the most heavily impacted, there are two things that I think have made that muted on the housing market. Number one is that we did have some extraordinary stimulus that helped replace income for a lot of people, and so we didn't see some of the stresses that we might have seen. But number two, those households that were most likely to have been affected, and you saw those industries that Jeremy, Jeremy pointed out that were at the, the strongest job losses, those are also industries where 
the individuals in them are least likely to be home buyers. And so those two things together have, have, have muted the impact of, of, the, of the job market stress on the housing market. I will say that I'm concerned that as we go forward and the impact of the recession begins to spread into other segments of the economy, and you saw that again a little bit in that beautiful mosaic chart that Jeremy put up that said it was too small to read, but, but it painted a picture of where, who was impacted initially and then who was being affected as we went forward. As we go forward, my fear is that we're going to see a broader impacts um, of, of the labor market stress that will begin to impact the housing market going forward. Yeah, I'll talk about that, but right now things are pretty good, haven't been too bad at least from the labor market perspective. From a mortgage market perspective, it's been stunning. You know, again, I said a year ago, so I take credit for the thing that I sort of got right. I'll have to take blame for the thing I got wrong. No way rates could get any lower than they were a year ago. And of course, here we are, they're even lower. And the thing that I want to point out here, so two, two things on this slide. Number one, the orange line here at the end is the Mortgage Bankers Association's forecast of the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. And the Mortgage Bankers Association right now is forecasting that the fixed rate, for long-term fixed rate, will stay below 3.4% through the end of 2021. So no projection of that going up in any time soon. The second thing that I wanted to highlight here is, is that you will notice the, the, the bluish line on the bottom is the 5-1 adjustable rate. That's a mortgage where the interest rate is fixed for five years, and then it adjusts annually after that. And like any adjustable rate mortgage, that presents less risk for the lender because they don't have to bear that long-term interest rate risk. And especially at a time when you're seeing long-term rates decline, you might expect that that interest rate risk is gonna be pretty severe. After all, you lock in a mortgage right now, and uh, weekly rates, I think most recent, were, were about two and three quarter percent. They're below 3% right now. You lock that in for 30 years, if mortgage, if rates go up in the future, that's a lot of interest rate risk for the lender or for the investor who holds that mortgage long term. And so you might think that the 5-1 adjustable rate might be a little bit more attractive from a lender's perspective. But you'll notice that recently here, the spread between the 5-1 adjustable and the 30-year fixed rate has essentially gone to zero. And what that's reflecting is the fact that long-term rates are going down because the Fed has ramped up again its purchases of mortgage-backed securities. And so the, that 30-year rate is being driven down, in a sense, artificially because of the activities of the Federal Reserve. If you'll recall, they had begun these purchases of mortgage-backed securities in the wake of the financial crisis, trying to help shore up the housing market and also trying to help um, stimulate the economy um, through purchases and through, through, through housing, you know, trying to stimulate the economy by stabilizing the housing market and making it possible for homeowners to borrow against that. They had been weaning themselves back from those mortgage-backed security holdings. And that has changed ever since the pandemic hit. And so we can see that in this chart. So those were the two things that I, I wanted to highlight from here. Nonetheless, these low mortgage rates have definitely had an impact in the housing market. And I'll show you where we're seeing that here in a, in a few moments. So what's been happening to home sales activity across the state of Kansas? Well, the blue bars in this chart represent actual sales through multiple listing services across the state of Kansas by month. And you can see we've got that typical seasonality that's going. The home sales go up in the spring and they tail off in the fall. And so to, to see through that, I put a moving average line on here. It's 12 month moving average. It gives you a sense of the underlying trend. And what we can see over here, and I guess on this side, I'm a little better to kind of point to exactly what's, what's happening most recently. Sorry if I'm blocking you over there. I, I, I deal with that with my students too, right? We got a round room and students sit on the corner and it's like, well, 
I gotta stand somewhere, so <laughs> you're, you're gonna get blocked a little. By the way, if you can't see it, my slides are posted both on the CEDBR website or posted on the Center for Real Estate website at wichita.edu slash real estate. And so you can download these as we go and look at those. So what have we seen with home sales activity? Well, if you, if you were at this conference last year and the year before, we really said home sales are beginning to plateau. They're slowing down. They're not growing at a very fast rate anymore, just a little bit. And essentially, we've been seeing more of the same. Well, there was a slight drop off in home sales in the wake of the pandemic. It wasn't very much. Um, and and we're, we're, we're just trying to keep our head above water in terms of, of continuing to grow home sales activity. Um, what does that look like for, for Ellis County and the Hayes area? Well, actually, you've seen pretty strong increases in home sales activity over the past year. And it's an interesting story as to why there's a difference between Hayes and the state as a whole. And that comes down to inventories. And so we measure balance in the housing market through a number called month supply. We take the number of homes that are actively listed and is available for sale at any given point in time. And we divide that by the average pace of sales over the past year. So for example, if there were a thousand homes for sale in a given market, and on average we were selling 200 homes a month, we would say 1,000 divided by 200, that's a five month supply. And generally we think that a balanced market is a market in which the month supply is somewhere between a four and six month supply. So that's this shaded region that I show here on this graph. Between a four and six month supply is balanced. It doesn't favor buyers, it doesn't favor sellers. And so on this I've shown you the Hayes area, which is this orange line that was up above the, the shaded region here for a number of years. The blue line is the United States as a whole, and the yellow or gold line is Kansas. And for Kansas, we've been in what would be considered a seller's market now for over five years. Incredibly tight inventories. Inventories that are now down below a two-month supply levels that we never imagined possible. There are some markets in the state where they have less than a one month supply of homes available for sale. Bidding wars are happening, um, uh, multiple offers above list price. It's a very, very aggressive competitive market. Hayes has been a little bit different. You've had a little bit more flush inventories over the past several years. Across the state as a whole, Home sales activity, demand has been incredibly strong, but home sales haven't been able to increase because there's just nothing out there to sell. If there were more inventories, more homes would sell. In Hayes, because you had a little bit of inventory, you've been able to increase sales over the past year. And one of the things you'll notice is that you've gone from what might have been considered to be more of a buyer's market prior to 2019 and, and earlier. Over the course of this year, your sales have picked up tremendously without a lot of additions to inventory. And so you're now in what would be considered the lower end of a balanced market. Okay. Um, Again, the, the big difference between the United the States, Kansas as a whole, and the Hayes area is the fact that you had some inventory to work with um, when, when, when this demand picked up here. And again, part of the reason for this increase in demand is the low interest rates that we're seeing. Now, not every home is the same. One of the challenges with the housing market is that we talk about averages but nobody owns the average Ellis County home. Everyone owns a home that's in a particular neighborhood, in a particular location in a neighborhood. And so sometimes I try and break this out by looking at different segments or sub-markets. And one way we could do this is by price ranges. And so I broke Ellis County data into um, 
four different price ranges. And these were relatively arbitrary price points, but I was trying to capture kind of the lower end of the market, the middle of the market, probably the most popular price ranges, the upper middle, and then the high end. And for this purpose, I picked $100,000, $200,000, and $300,000 list prices as my cut points. And so what you can see here is that um, for more modestly priced homes, we'd been a little bit you know, into perhaps what was a buyer's market range for homes priced below $100,000. That's the orange line. The green line is between $100,000 and $200,000. And the bluish line uh, was between 200 and 300,000. But that yellow line, which is the top end of the market, had been the place where inventories were really flush, okay, where you had a lot more inventory. But in every single price point, we've seen those, those inventories tighten up over the past year. And so that's, that's the, the story that I see here from this. So what does that mean for our home sales forecast? We don't forecast every county across the state. We forecast the state as a whole and the large metropolitan areas. Um, but for the state of Kansas as a whole, we're forecasting a very modest increase in home sales activity this year. And that is limited primarily by the fact that inventories are so tight across so many markets. Sales would increase more if only we had more inventory available for sale. We're forecasting a slight decline next year. This isn't a dramatic drop off, but a modest drop off. And it's really due to two reasons. Number one is the continuing tight inventories. But number two is my belief that we're going to see the economic fallout begin to spread more broadly and begin to have more of an impact on, those, uh, on the home buying segments of the economy, not just those who are in, in you know, jobs that are less likely to be homeowners. So before I move on here, first of all, uh, I, I want to let my good friend Errol here tell me what have I said that's wrong, uh, because he's my, I sometimes joke. What I do in my job a lot is I go around and I talk with realtors, and I listen to what they have to say, and then I come back and I repeat what they've told me, and everybody thinks I'm really smart, when all I am is being a parrot. And so Earl, what have I said that's right? What have I said that's wrong? Oh, that's, he's very nice to me. He says I'm right on. That's very kind of you, Earl. Okay. So home sales activity, again, we're forecasting that um, it will be up slightly this year, down slightly next year. And I'm a little bit worried about the longer term impacts of the underlying economy on housing demand. But so far, you know, the labor market hasn't really shown any de detrimental impacts to housing markets across the state. By the way, I'll take just a note here, because I saw it this morning, an article in the Wall Street Journal that was essentially saying the same story nationwide. Um, it, it said that housing markets have sort of defied the economic downturn being really strong, but there may be reasons for concerns that it won't last long term. Um, I will say I did not believe that the housing market was going to see a sharp downturn this year when we saw the, the, the COVID hit. Um, simply because inventories were so tight and we were in such a solid situation coming into the downturn. And so even as we see home sales activity decline next year, I don't believe that's going to put us into a situation of a buyer's market. We're so far skewed towards tight inventories that the only thing that reduced sales activity is going to do is push us into more of a balanced market situation. And so that's why I don't think home sales are going to drop dramatically at this point. So what do we think will happen with home prices? Well, when you have a situation where you've had strong demand like what we've seen, and you see very limited inventories, we should expect very strong home price appreciation. And indeed, this is the year-over-year -year percentage change in the Federal Housing Finance Agency's Home Price Index, which is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of kind of the same home and how much it's appreciated from one year to the next. And you can see here that um, 
The U.S. typically is, at, is more extreme during the downturn back in the housing crisis. You saw some sharp declines in U.S. home prices. And then really healthy appreciation, above 5% a year on average for a number of years. Kansas typically trails behind the U.S. as a whole. But over the last year or so, we've been as strong as the rest of the country. And that's unusual because we don't have the land constraints that many parts of the country have. But what's the most interesting story here is this orange line, which is what I call rural Kansas counties. That's, that's really not fair. Hayes is not a rural area. Um, this, this is a measure of every county in Kansas that's not a part of a metropolitan area. So you take the counties around Wichita that are in the Wichita MSA, the Kansas City MSA, Topeka, Lawrence, and Manhattan. If you take those out, and then you ask what's happening with typical home values in every other county in the state of Kansas. That includes all of Northwest, all of Southwest Kansas, most of North Central Kansas, Southeast Kansas, a lot of differences across these areas. But the home price appreciation over the past year or so has jumped up to be on par with what we've seen across the state. Really strong home price appreciation over the last year or so. Typically, you know, dropping down maybe two and a half percent, that's much more typical for what we would have expected. So we don't have an index specifically for Ellis County or Hayes, but one way we can get at underlying trends of home prices is to look at the median sale price. The median sale price is the price at which half of the homes sell for more and half of the sales some. <laughs> I can say that, can't I? Half of the homes sell for more, half of the homes sell for a lower price, okay? And what we've seen here, Hayes typically has some of the higher uh, median sale prices of homes in any part of the state. Home values here can be high compared to uh, Lawrence or Kansas City in, in some instances. Very, very high cost of housing here. But median sale prices have been dropping just slightly over the last couple of years. And this year, maybe just starting to tail up again. Again, that's reflective of the higher inventories that we were seeing the last few years, and then the tightening of inventories more recently. So not as dramatic as we've seen in some other parts of the state, but still some modest appreciation this year. So what's our forecast for home price appreciation? We're forecasting that home prices across the state are going to be increasing at a very healthy clip, 4.8% this year, and another 5.7% next year. Again, a lot of that being driven by the large metropolitan areas, including Kansas City and Wichita, with very strong home price appreciation. The last thing that we forecast is new home construction activity for the state as a whole. And again, if you've seen me here in the past, I've said you'd think we've got strong demand for housing, tight inventories, home prices are appreciating, we ought to be seeing increases in new home construction. And for a number of years, that just hadn't been happening. And the reason, I'm gonna go back to my home prices chart here, is that if you actually go past this slide, you go back over here, you know, not just 2013, 12, 11, but let's go back to 2010, 2009, we had seen home prices across the state of Kansas that were essentially flat or modestly declined. We'd have a year where it may have been, you know, minus 0.2%, but then the next year plus 0.6. But it just bounced around zero for a lot of years across the state. At the same time, construction costs of new homes continued to increase. Labor became more expensive. Materials got more expensive. And what that meant is that there was an increasing gap between what it would cost to build a new home versus what you could buy in looking at an existing home. And what I've said is we just need to have more years of this solid home price appreciation to get to a place where existing homes are, are, are getting more expensive, at least as expensive as new homes are to make them more competitive. And what we've finally seen now is that we are actually in a place 
especially when we're looking at um, the Kansas City market and the Wichita market, but we're seeing it in all of the large markets across the state, of some reasonably healthy uh, new home construction permits. We're, we're forecasting a 12.1% increase this year, but a 21% increase next year. We're really seeing some strong growth in, in construction activity. And again, we think it's due to two things. Number one is the fact that existing home prices are finally starting to get to a place where it's not so much of a gap between what you can buy with an existing home versus a new home. New homes are more competitive as a result. But I also think this is being driven in part by the incredibly low interest rates. And there are more buyers that are in a position uh, where they're saying, if I can get my forever dream home and build the home that I never thought I could have before, and I can do it now because of these low rates, maybe I'll go ahead and stretch and I'll push myself into that. And so that also is having an impact of, dry, of increasing the number of permits across the state. Will that be affected by the availability of lumber? Yeah, uh, lumber is an issue, right? We've, we've had uh, some really sharp increases in, in the cost of lumber. Um, that's going to happen when you actually take all of the piece of, of the cost of a home. That lumber has a has a has a meaningful impact, but it's not like if lumber costs go up fifty percent that the cost of construction goes up fifty percent. It's one component of many components. Of one of, big one is labor uh, that go into the, to that building site. So it it makes it a little more difficult to build, especially at the lower price points. But we're closer to being able to build, say, a $250,000 home. That was hard for a lot of years. You just could not build a $250,000 home that was in any way comparable to what you could find in the existing home market. And that's, that spread has gotten less in recent years. So that is the summary of our forecast. Um, again, Modest home sales increase this year with a slight decline next year as the economic environment weakens. Um, building permit activity is going to continue to to be relatively strong um, and home price appreciation at a very healthy clip because even as we see demand tail off a bit in the existing home market, we're not going to see it drop enough to, to flip us from this seller's market that we've been in. We do have mark, uh, forecasts for all the major markets across the state. And with that, I think, do I have time for questions? Yes, you do. I do. So any questions, comments? Yes. So if you go back two slides, let's see, that one right there. So take a look, I guess, explain 2021 there. Total home sales are going to decrease. Yet look at the uh, permits to build a new home. So is that telling me that more people are going for the new home, or is it just that you're not going to have as many used homes out there to purchase? Is that what I'm reading into that? So yeah, so the question here is if you look at what we're forecasting here, we're forecasting a slight decline in existing home sales next year, although this does include new homes. It's both new and existing, total home sales. But we're in forecasting a very strong increase in new home building permits. And yes, that's reflecting a transition. It, it, you know, part of the challenge we've had, we've said, existing home sales would have been increasing at a lot healthier clip if there were only more homes available for sale. And part of that has been the fact that we've not been building them ever since the financial crisis. We're still at levels of building permit activity for single family homes that are about half of what they were at the peak, okay? So we have not been adding to inventories in ways that are really necessary to meet the needs in the market. Um, and so there's room for new home construction to happen even as we're softening. And again, this, this decline in home sales activity is not a very sharp decline. It won't be enough to move us, you know, when we're sitting with about a two month supply, Maybe we'll get close to a four-month supply, but that's still the bottom end of balance where we should be adding more construction activity. Other questions? And I don't know how I would get questions from somebody who is with us remotely. Tell, uh, tell to send me a text message. So Andrea, we'll you can send Andrea, uh, yeah. send Jeremy a text and we can... They can write it in the chat box and Andrea will... Okay, so, so if those of you at home send in a chat box 
and then they will forward it to me through a text message. So please, I want to answer questions if I can. I have a question in the back here. You're, uh, you get all your information from MLSs, is that correct? No, um, home sales come from the multiple listing service. Right. Okay. Uh, the single family building permits come from the U.S. Bureau of the Census. Uh, they do a monthly uh, permitting and home, sale, home starts and new home construction release. And then home price appreciation comes from the Federal Housing Finance Agency, uh, which is the regulator that oversees Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so that measure includes essentially any mortgages that are sold to Fannie and Freddie are used to estimate that home price appreciation. So. Rural areas, Hayes being one, and you're yeah, I wouldn't call Hayes rural, but yeah. But the small, small markets don't have MLSs typically anyway. They may be part of the Dodge or Hayes MLS, but they're for the most part, a lot of your numbers are based on MLS information in terms of the Kansas and some of that. Yeah, I mean, as you go to to some of the the, the much smaller counties across the state. Um, the, the coverage with which those will show up within the MLS can be can vary a great deal, but on you know we, we have an MLS system that actually operates out of uh, of Goodland right and so we access the Goodland MLS we access the the um, the Hayes MLS we access the Great Plains which is based out of Salina but that also includes Great Bend and uh, so for instance you know one of the things we put together Russell is a community where it kind of spans two different board jurisdictions. And so we actually combine the data off of both uh, the Hayes MLS and the Great Plains Board of Re Realtors to be able to help them have some, some data about everything that's going on. But one legit, one question I think I hear underlying what you're asking is what about homes that aren't sold with a realtor? Do those, get, do those show up? And the, the simple answer to that is no, they don't show up here. That being said, um, when we've looked at this in the past, and I haven't looked at it in a little while, um, when you measure it based on sales validation questionnaires that go through the, uh, the you know, that have to be filed every time that there is a transfer of a deed, the trends and patterns of, of home sales that show up in the MLS versus the deeds that are registered, you know, the, the certificate of value questionnaires that are filed at the Register of Deeds office just go in lockstep with one another. Matter of fact, sometimes with the uh, Wichita MLS, um, I, uh, I'm, sometimes people will ask me, you know, oh, how do you think last month was? And I may be on the first or second of the month, I'll say, oh, I think we're gonna be up about 2% this month. And people think I'm really, really brilliant, but all I've done is I've, I get almost right after the first of the month, the appraiser's office there sends me their certificate, uh, uh, their, 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 their deed filings. And once I look at those filings of deeds, um, it, it, you know that that's almost all residential and I can predict pretty health accurately there. So in short, we think that the underlying trends are very reflective. Okay. Well, are there any questions from anybody remotely? Okay. I had one more question here in the middle. Uh, so it doesn't really affect Kansas that much that I've seen, but how is delinquencies and stuff, if we go into more economic crisis, delinquencies, and then it obviously uh, hits the financial sector and also some of the, the housing. I've seen big, you know, Miami, New York, you know, LA, Las Vegas, there's some like 5, 10, 15% delinquent right now, and we're kind of teetering uh, with, with a lot of stimulus. How does that affect Kansas as a whole if there were a big spike in delinquencies? Yeah, so, so so the concern has been as you have people who have homes and they've been laid off, and if they're unable to make those payments, are we going to see a spike in delinquencies and then in foreclosures? And foreclosures are where we really care about it because that's when that home is put back onto the market and often can have a very negative price impact, not only on that home, but also on neighboring homes because of the stress that it places. And um, you know, I, I do think that that's a concern going forward, but it's not nearly the concern that we had when we were hitting the, 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 the peak of the housing crisis back in 2008. And the reason is inventories are so tight. And so we never want to see homeowners go into foreclosure. We want them to be in a situation where they can resolve. Um, lenders, I think for the most, I, I will tell you this, this is one of those reasons why I always recommend 
to home buyers that you work with a local local professionals of all sorts, whether it's a title company, whether it's a real estate, uh, whether it's a mortgage company, a realtor firm or whatever. Um, and for mortgages, when you have somebody that you can go to and sit across their desk, even if I'm wearing a mask, um, that I can sit across their desk and talk about my issues, you know, those local servicers and the lenders who are servicing at local are, are much more able to kind of respond to the situation and deal with it. And in my conversations with lenders, at least in the Wichita area, they're really monitoring and looking closely. So I'm optimistic that that won't be a severe hit for us. And I think Jeremy's standing, which may mean that I'm out of time. And so with that, uh, once again, encourage you to uh, visit our websites and you can access all of our presentations and, and data that we have on Kansas real estate markets. So with that, thank you very much.